Welcome to Team Rabbit Hole Edition 93. God is a DJ with Ian Welch. Welcome. How's it going, Ian? It's going well. How are you guys doing? Can't complain. It's a nice day in Colorado, up in the high country. Um, I'm going to go ahead and give you the content some point and kind of let you kind of tell us who you are. Uh, and I want to give context in terms of how I met you, which is also unique and fun to me. Um, but something we do here on the podcast is describe, um, well, basically it's episode 93, which is a thelemic number, which is kind of funny. Um, but I take those numbers and I break it down for the major arcana of the tarot. And then Raphael will read a card from his Galactic Heritage deck, which I actually just recently got. They're dope. Um, but this 93 is 12, which is the Hanged Man. Uh, very much Odin on the Tree of Idrisil vibes, right? I now surrender, thy will be done. Uh, the Hanged Man is about surrendering into the unknown, sacrificing your idea of power, allowing the pause to give you perspective, and attainment of the Tiger Self and Enlightenment are within reach, according to David DeAngelis, the Starman Tarot book, who's also actually been on the podcast. Shout out, David. Anyway, um, Raphael, tell us really quick what 93 is in your deck. Really quick, and we'll just take one moment. So it is number 93, Sirius. You're going to like this one. Assistance without interference. Future timeline. In the ancient days, Syrians learned a lot of lessons about helping without interfering. Some of these lessons were painful and difficult. Now that the Sirius energy has made its transition, it has integrated those lessons and offers loving assistance without interference. Examine who you wish to help in this life. Find ways to do so from a place of neutrality without interfering. This represents a karmic pattern from ancient days that you are now ready to release. But you first must be mindful of the difference between assistance and interference. Fascinating. Any uh, resonances or syncs for you on those descriptions, Ian? Oh, I mean, of course. Uh, well, a little bit about myself is um, I am a DJ. I lay claim to that first because that was my first passion as far as music goes. And I'm also a 32nd degree Freemason here in Washington State. And I'm involved with the Grand Lodge of Washington and a past master of my ceremonial Blue Lodge. So Sirius, the dog star, has some connotations in Freemasonry. It's uh, the Blazing Star, which is um, pretty intricately woven into the fabric of the craft as a guiding light towards higher consciousness. Right. Uh, Sirius, we were just discussing in the last episode, is the kind of spiritual sun if one wants to put it that way in the binary kind of situation we have with our sun um i'm pretty sure the dogon people have some situation with understanding sirius and it's patterning with us um thanks ancient aliens or whatever i learned that from but uh it's funny because um <laughs> what you kind of uh said there made me think of i don't know if you've seen um Steven Spielberg's AI, I've seen it on Mushrooms back in high school, which is kind of trippy, but he has this film with AI where there's basically this blue light fairy uh, that Haley Joel Osmond's AI kind of character, uh, kind of it's Pinocchio 2.0 basically, but it's like the fairy of the blue light, and it's kind of that energy where it's like this kind of transcendental um, feminine thing, uh, and in the last episode we just had uh, our friend um, uh, Liam was... Um, saying that it's related to ISIS at some level. There's a lot of levels to these things. We're going to go down these rabbit holes most dolphinately. And speaking of dolphins, nice little intro track there. It sounded like, I don't even know, um, Echo the Dolphin from Sega on acid or something. But I will just say how I'm <laughs> aware of you, Ian, uh, a.k.a. D DJ Bodhi Saifa. I love the name, by the way. Um, long story short, last year I, I have a friend. Uh, he reached out to me randomly. There's no such thing as random. I guess this was just a sink or whatever. He hit me up. He had heard on one of my live kind of tarot jams or whatever I do on Facebook um, that I'd never been to a festival somehow. My brother's a drummer and he, he's been in many festivals 
um, Sonic Bloom and stuff like that. And I'm a guitarist. I've played a lot of things, but I just never been to a festival somehow. And um, basically this kid was like, um, he goes by Neon Felicity on Facebook. Shout out Neon. Um, basically, maybe that's his legal name now. I don't even know. Uh, but the point is he hit me up and was like, yo, I, you haven't been to a festival. I'm going to be volunteering um, with this chick at uh, an, uh, basically an Orca, Orcas Island festival, um, Imagine Festival. Do you want to come volunteer with me? Like you can do this and how, you know get in for free or whatever. And I was like, hell yeah. That was last September. Um, that's actually where I met you. I, uh, volunteered for a few days. I was doing stuff, kind of sweeping up during programs or whatever, kind of doing a gopher kind of stuff. Uh, I ran into you in a tent. You were kind of helping do sound and stuff. And then later that night I ate a gel tab and I went and you were the silent disco DJ and I had such a fucking blast. Yeah, buddy. Yeah, dude, that was one of my favorite things ever, straight up. So thank you very much for that. Uh, very surreal to be on acid with a silent disco. You take off, you know, the headphones and everyone's kind of just like, you know, making noises. And it's just a different, it was very oh, surreal. for sure, yeah. And I try to create an atmosphere whenever I DJ as well. I mean, I pick my songs for their sonic resonance and try to weave a tapestry, if you will, or an environment that gets people in, you know, up and down cyclical moods and happy, sad and powerful. And, you know, um, so I'm glad that you could experience that for sure. <laughs> Well, it was a beautiful festival as far as the first kind of cherry popping of a festival. I shout out to, you know, uh, Imagine Festival, Orcas Island, all y'all. Um, and like I said, yeah, I was shout volunteering. Shout out to Darren for sure. Yeah, Darren. Exactly. I haven't met him, but uh, saw him at the festival. He's a cool guy. Um, so, but the point is at one point I was like helping you load speakers or something. And I noticed on your truck, a bunch of Masonic G's and stickers and stuff. And I was like, oh shit, this guy's a Freemason, which obviously has a lot of cultural baggage to it, but it doesn't really scare me. Um, and I kind of tucked that away in my brain and I, months went by, right? Like I didn't talk to you. I kind of went back, doing all sorts of shit, came back to Colorado. Um, and at some point, I figured out I had to go through um, the official lineup and website, and I was doing all this sleuthing, thing, and I figured out who you were, Buddy Saifa. I sent you a message, and I was like, bro, come on the podcast. I have some questions. I think you're, you know, if you're a Freemason, whatever, and you're like, yeah, let's talk, blah, blah, blah. So that's kind of our context. I, we didn't really hang out much. I watched you. Kind of, I mean, we did to the degree that I mean, I shook your hand. We talked, lo loaded some gear, but it's not like we were kicking it, smoking doobies or anything. Um, watched you Which would have been cool, set. too. <laughs> Oh, next time, for sure. I don't smoke right now, really, but uh, next time, for sure. Um, in any event, uh, your set was sick as fuck. It was really, honestly, an important kind of moment for me, just because I was definitely aware of your kind of building and um, manipulating time space in a very kind of uh, intentional way, we'll put it. Um, so you're really an engineer on that front, it felt like. Uh, sonic engineer. For sure, for sure. And that's purposeful. Intention is the name of the game. Um, so anyway, that's, I just want people to be aware of how I, I mean, we're not buddies, but like I've hung out with you a little and then I've reached out to you eventually and we've been kind of kicking the can. I was in Australia and then you've been busy with uh, doing stuff for COVID stuff you were saying and you had a company doing something with that. Um, so we've just been busy and we got you in here locked in. I'm super stoked to have you here. I am deeply honored, and everything you said honors me, and I appreciate that. And likewise, you seem like a really cool person. And I've listened to a few of these podcasts, and you talk about some very heady stuff and and philosophize, and that's what I've done always. I mean, every day pretty much is like a weird existential crisis for me, not in some, you know, oh, woe is me sense, but in the sense that I just keep re uh, realizing just these minor truths of the microcosm and macrocosm of everything and it's tripping me out all the time i mean it doesn't blow my mind anymore but it's definitely uh knocking on that third eye door you know all the time so i'm just constantly seeking answers and digging things up and trying to apply them if they're philosophies and but i'm also raising two kids too and that's got its own challenges so i have one foot in the mundane if you want to call it that, the lay the lay term, uh, householder, and that's the Buddhists would would have called it, um, and I have one foot firmly planted in the clouds of esotericism and deep mysticism and Freemasonry as well. Props, and I obviously I'm at a point. I mean, I don't want kids. Uh, props on you for perpetuating the human species. I'm not going to be part of that game, uh, so I'm appreciative of, of that kind of dualistic nature. I'm a double Gemini. I love how some. Uh, and moon double Gemini. I don't know your chart, actually. I just realized I should have probably asked for it. Uh, do you know much about astrology? 
That's a kind I know of a little bit. Question. I mean, I, I have I have a, a ton of friends who are astrologers. I mean, anybody from Kurt Bauman, who's in the Burned, and with Katie Gray, he does um, Sea Stars as well, and he's an, a bit of an astrologer. And Jim and I, Brett is a friend of mine, and he's been on here and a had, few times. Yeah. Oh yeah, I heard the I heard the show, and uh, and so I've sat and done some some rapping with him over a table about how all these things, you know, with, um, coincide together. So I am um, Aries. I'm an Aries in my sun house, and my moon is in Cancer, and my ascending star is in Cancer as well. So I'm pretty sensitive to energy and how things feel um, below the surface of how and life in general. That doesn't surprise me because you do have this kind of tenacity and kind of like uh, leadership quality about it. Like I could tell you're kind of like, I'm doing my thing. I'm doing it for me. But at the same time, there's this kind of uh, familial nurturance. Doesn't surprise me you're going to have kind of a um, home life. Let's put it that way. So makes sense. Dolphinately. Um, do me a favor. I The conscious is yours. I kind of want it as brief or as long as you want to go into it. Like where are you coming from? Who are you? How did you get to where you are? For sure, we could do the etymology. That's uh, origin story. Um, I didn't know much about Freemasonry until I sort of turned my sights onto it back in 2012. I had just uh, actually it was about 2009 when I met my current partner. Her name's Asifa, and she's one of the, the main stage designer for um, Imagine Festival on Orcus, and a brilliant lady, and very talented. Props for and her design. I, that was amazing. Oh yeah. She does the white fabric and, you know, her her and the main group of uh, builders, uh, which I guess includes myself now since I do the dome. But anyway, I, when I met her in 09, we were walking through the streets of Fremont, Seattle, and I noticed uh, there were some symbols on the ground. And I was like, hey, wait a second. And they pointed in a very esoteric way. I mean, it wouldn't look like it was pointing, but I realized it was pointing to another symbol. And then so I followed this map point of symbols and we ended up at a Masonic Lodge. And I walked up the stairs and then, you know, was met by a group of guys who were in suits and another guy who had a giant sword. He was the Tyler. And uh, I <laughs> just asked them what they were doing and they explained what they were. And I was like, okay, cool. And we left and then fast forward to 2012 and I went down a uh, pun intended rabbit hole on YouTube and it was just this insane rabbit hole of you know the the elite power hungry elite Freemasons are running the world and they're all satanic and so I went down that just oh my god I tripped myself out and I was like well wait a second you know my grandpa my my dad's dad was a Shriner, a 32nd degree, a past master of a lodge. I was like, he would not be involved in some weird satanic shit. Uh, I'm sorry, he just wouldn't. So I had to petition my own lodge in the San Juan Islands here to to figure it out for myself. And I wanted to go down there. And I, you know, I told my wife one night, I was like, look, if I ever come back home and I'm scared of shit and, and I'm like talking about some deep, dark, weird satanist stuff we need to get the f out of here is what i said to her and uh that that moment has never uh arisen never come to fruition i've only ever seen some of the best people i've ever met in my life in a freemason's lodge and only a few of the hundreds and hundreds of guys that i've met are true mystics and seekers of knowledge and gnostics and um myself i will humbly as humble as possible include myself in a, in the seeker category of someone who's not satisfied with you know what's given on the surface and uh some of those um some of the rites and mysteries of Freemasonry in general, like the first three degrees, are very emblematic, and, and I knew there was more to it. So I just climbed that mystic ladder all the way, you know, got my Master Mason, and then I became an officer of the Lodge, and I spent basically five years every meeting, going to every single meeting, learning and memorizing everything for all the rituals so I could initiate people and then I became a uh, master of my lodge, my blue lodge in masonry um, in, I think, 2017 was my year. So uh, it was pretty good. I had to be voted by secret ballot. So the guys there wanted me to be the master. And there was some apprehension, you know. I Who am I to think I'm an example for anybody? You know, that's not where I come from. I'm not. Um, you mentioned leadership qualities in me while I'm deeply honored by that. I don't always see that part in myself, you know, I've always just called it a stubborn nature where I just plow forward and, you know, you're coming with me or or not, but I'm going this way and this is the trail I'm blazing. And, and so, um, 
I've been a little bit more sensitive to it in my days now. But uh, that was my my Freemasonry in a nutshell. I mean, I I think there's some deeper stuff, some omnism happening, uh, where we pull from a lot of different religious and philosophical ideals, from Pythagorean Pythagorean mathematics to you know harmony of the spheres and and um, straight up Osirian and um, death rituals <laughs> that get included in there and that that probably goes over the heads of quite a few of the new initiates where they don't really understand what they're seeing or, or hearing. And I think that's an important part of, of the mystery, keeping that mystery alive is the people that are new to masonry are almost purposely misled um, to keep you guessing. Or you could stop short and not guess at all. And that's the dividing point, as you can see the guys who are just happy the fact that they're Master Masons and they go to a lodge where they can go and have a few drinks with their bros. And then there's guys like me who create 30 to 40 page slideshows and try to get my brothers to understand that this shit is deep and it goes deeper and older and probably was not necessarily called Freemasonry back in the day. It might very well have been called the Illuminati. And... um you know, and there was times when symbols kept a lot of our bros from being persecuted um, all the way up into Nazi Germany. And so you have the little tiny blue flower pendant that you'll see a lot of Freemasons wear. That was um, that little blue flower was sort of the secret symbol of being a Freemason for those guys and share that knowledge. And so, uh, you know, it comes to, luckily now with the media and everything, we're half the secrets are already out and the real honorable thing about being a mason is even though google pretty much you could find anything on google can you keep the secrets yourself that have been explained to you and um pass down that knowledge and that's where the true sign of a freemason is word gnosis is one hell of a drug uh, Raphael, i thought you wanted to say something i would have just a few brief questions some of them you touched upon um, first thing, uh, I assume you're familiar with Gmail. That's totally a Masonic apron, is it not? Oh, without a doubt. And it's, oh my God, I found a few symbols where my other Masonic brother, a few? who's also, the, the, <laughs> oh yeah, we, we keep finding them in um, ads and things like that. And oh, you too? Um, oh yeah. And I think there's for sure probably Freemasons that are in higher up positions in society and they're just sort of in a half joking way or maybe a prideful way or um, maybe a, a truly subliminal way, uh, put putting the messages out there, putting the symbols out there just to see if they can uh, wake people up. Since we Hustling cruddle crumbs kind of thing. Kind of. I can't recruit anybody. I can say to like a very good friend of mine, which I've only done it like two or three times, um, hey, you might actually like what we do in this lodge um, if you want to come to a meeting. But that's about the scope of how much I can extend an offer to somebody. And we're pretty strict about that. We have to. It has to be of your own free will that you come to a lodge, not just because your bro wants you to. You certainly no aren't going to make any ex extra money. I... I haven't become rich from being it, and I'm a 32nd degree, and I'm <laughs> – what does that mean other than it's, – it's really how far each brother wants to push themselves in masonry. So I, I'm not satisfied being at the lower rung and, and being kept in the dark, so I'm going to keep trying to knock on those doors and, and figure out what it's all about. Yeah, I mean – by 32nd degree, one may say that or assume you should be on the payroll by now if you're master of a lodge. Of course, I'm quite familiar with potentially with all larger organizations. You have quite a few different aspects. Of course, the other thing I was going to get at, which you kind of already touched upon, at least from your personal history, is the whole idea of, let's call it the infiltration of Freemasonry. Or let's just put it in a you know yugic sense as we like to do around here in terms of Kali Yuga, the fall of consciousness. So all kind of structures will ossify and you know create this negative polarity as well, just because it is the time as well. So I'm not one to say this or that group as a blanket statement is to blame for anything. So to me, it's quite obvious there's many different uh, layers. I would still, I'd of course be interested in your personal view in terms of infiltration or in terms of power being misused, potentially not in the lodges you're familiar with, but 
as far as I can get it, if it's done that way, then usually there is like several layers of compartmentalization and pyramid structure. And of course, you will not get, let's say, quote unquote, in, get infiltrated into the, let's say, just for sake of argument, uh, satanic, satanic back lodge, you know, if you're not a real good psychopath already, you know, you're not going to, you know, get invited yeah, if it exists, yeah. right? <laughs> Yeah, so um totally just to i think uh, point it out, it's... just very briefly um and this is maybe the delineation for me and maybe what i'd be interested in your view you already mentioned you like to share information for me i really like this uh, kind of division or discrimination that dark journalist puts forth with the idea of x share and x protect and steiner would be for example more part of x share and some other groups that maybe more try to um, sequester information. We've just been talking about the Jesuits on the past show. They may be a candidate, or at least certain aspects of them may be a candidate. They would be more part of so-called ex-protect. And I find that at the end of the day, whilst it one must also be really careful about sharing information, just like you put it, and about inviting, because many things, especially this type of knowledge, is not for everyone. Uh, however, I would say there is a basic discrimination for oneself if one is more interested in amassing and keeping information in order to confuse others or keep others in the quote-unquote dark and only oneself be illuminated, or whether one is interested in sharing that light, so to speak. For sure, for sure. I appreciate that. Um, well, where to begin, really? I, I think there's two circles of Freemasonry, as I've heard it called before, um, and uh, some brief history real quick of myself is, again, my, my grandfather, my father's father, is was a Freemason and a Shriner. And my father was not because he doesn't believe in all that hooey is what he told me. And uh, I picked up the, the, you know, the baton from my grandpa and kept the, the craft going in my family. And I married into a family where my father-in-law is a former Knights Templar as well. <clears throat> so he's um, he's an interesting character. But I think there's um, some infiltration. I guess um, America was built on the foundations of a Masonic Lodge. It's The government is run like one. And uh, you see, I mean, if Jim and I, Brett, you go and check out his YouTube video about uh, how Washington, D.C. is laid out. Him and I have talked about this. There was no accident there. And the fact that I think that there are two circles in Freemasonry, the one that I belong in, which is all the way up to 33 degrees, and on both sides, York and Scottish Rite, where the York Rite has Templars and the Scottish Rite has the 32nd degree, you know, Masters of the Royal Secret. Um, there's it, it, it encompasses all those groups. And the, the first circle is the outer one, which I belong in, and we're like the PR people. We don't have anything bad to say about Freemasonry because we've never witnessed anything bad about Freemasonry. We've witnessed some bad eggs or bad people inside the craft, but that doesn't denote that the entire craft itself is sullied by those people. Um, and then we have another circle of Freemasonry, which is that inner power elite of one percenters that are also Freemasons, technically bros of mine if I ever met them, but I would never be able to even touch the lower rungs of their echelons, you know, and they might, that small coterie of Freemasonry inhabitants might be the guys and girls on some levels that run shit and run it are running it into the ground like build up or bad shit basically yeah, yeah pretty much i mean come on actually... if, if you yeah if you don't think that that stuff is happening then then you're ignorant not you guys but people in general who don't consider that there is um there are active groups out there that understand their connections with each other and their network and then they use that for their own selfish gain so that's sort of um uh it's just a reality that's life and that I try to work against that, uh, maybe with my own energies, and and I have you know the Buddha is tattooed on my left forearm, and and uh, sort of a reminder constantly to be present and mindful, and the fact that we are kind of living in a, a living simulation in a way where we're bioorganic computers, and so in a sense we're vibration and energy and batteries, if you will. And so um, the law of attraction and manifestation is very real. And and so a lot of what I take from masonry is building my own inner King Solomon's temple to purify myself and um, transmute base 
thoughts of you know that serpent spinal column brain to higher consciousness that you know I've seen glimpses of on LSD or something in in previous days, <laughs> and uh, you know always trying to make it back to that space where we see our inner light. I appreciate that you also have your DJ name being Bodhisattva, Bodhisattva kind of play on words there. For sure, because I think we all have a kernel of Bodhisattva in us and the microcosm of Bodhisattva energy inside of us. And we're so sullied up and dirtied up by reality and things that are thrown and things that are purposely programmed into us to dissuade us from even reaching these types of conversations. Um, and so it's very much a code, a cipher, a code that you have to break within yourself to become the Bodhisattva. So that's sort of why I just I'm a writer. So I like um, twists and turns and plot twists and and, uh, you know, distracting euphemisms, if you will. And a lot of allegorical teaching in masonry is very much you're taught one thing, but it actually has nothing to do with what you think it does. And, and we know that we're doing that. We're purposely misleading some candidates um, to keep them guessing. So it's not all revealed in the, in the very beginning and you're bored. Well, in a weird way, it's like the Tao that can be named isn't the Tao. I think in some way this is, there's a lot of levels in my opinion as, um, as to what's going on with Freemasonry. Like you were saying, George Washington, the founding fathers, but specifically Washington was inaugurated in full Freemasonic gear. Like, there's no mystery. Oh, here. dude, like, yeah. In our lodge, we have a picture of him doing that master symbol. And so, you know, it's, yeah, it's, it's, this country was, they're like, you know, how can we create a free country and, but model it off of a government that actually works for to justify their means. And at the time it was the lodge, the Freemasonic lodge. And there's, um, there is some, uh, there are some stories in lodges of during the, um, revolutionary war, uh, the British come rolling through a town and, uh, the guys of the Masonic lodge have put two guards at their doors because they don't want the British to, you know, to destroy their lodge. But instead the Brits while marching through, and installed one of their guards or two of their guards alongside the American ones and further protected the lodge as sort of a neutral zone. Um, and while that may be great for Freemasons to think about the solidarity among brethren um, at the time, uh, you know, how heinous that was with the British here and what they were doing. So that kind of solidarity is only cute uh, for a second when you consider the atrocities that happened. Well, in a weird way, it's like a transcendental... Um fraternity obviously where uh, I think Raphael maybe was talking about this in another episode but the idea being or maybe it was Corey Kaplan I was talking with him about it where it's like um, it seems to be um, that how how does one because I look at uh, in a tarot sense um, as you know how would I put this the emperor card being the Masonic kind of card where it's like how do we measure and weigh and discreetly organize something as wild as the universe because it's this like open source like feminine thing and it's not to subdue it past a point. I think it's to work with it ultimately, hopefully. Um, but the idea is there's better and worse ways to do that. And for a long time, it was like Genghis Khan and, you know, I'm going to, you know, meets back on the menu, boys, and kind of this kind of horde mentality and like uh, almost a Nietzschean will to supremacy through violence and stuff. And it was a very dark place to be on Earth for a long period of time. Like if you didn't know the people around your campfire, you'd kill them or whatever, just, or, you know, you'd think yeah. you could be killed. So the end of the Kali way, Yuga in a way. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. It seems cyclic. Um, but in some weird way, I think of, if, at least in terms of a positive spin from a neutral perspective, because I'm not a Mason, um, I'm interested in it to a degree. But I feel like um, thanks to uh, Randall Carlson's uh, Joe Rogan kind of appearances i think he kind of gave away some of the mystery because he was like we're not all of it but like it's like it's we're doing as above so below as within so without kind of pageantry in some weird way like um astrological that's a good and... description actually <laughs> that's pretty accurate if you want to think about that um uh, the reality is is um and not to betray my bros uh, because i don't know how a lot of the ritual is done in every single lodge uh as far as okay, so the jurisdiction goes like this: every state has a grand lodge in in America, and that that grand lodge establishes the rules for all its subservient lodges in each city to to follow. And it's their canonical rules where they can't be changed except by voting, and the voting has to be taken place by, you know, up to two hundred plus people at the grand lodge, which I do every year, and it's a it's an intense voting process, and we use 
nowadays we use this you know electronic voting cards which makes it easier but um i've seen votes that are really good ones um get tabled for years um but the most recent vote that i did appreciate uh for good reason for for my own personal desire was the fact that we could change the usage of the word uh holy bible in a lodge to the volume of sacred law and if, if that's the case the volume of sacred law can incorporate judaism uh, mithraism if you wanted to be a, a follower of mithra or whatever it doesn't matter or any doctrines other than just having it be specifically about the holy bible because i'm not a christian and um part of the reason i'm not a knight's templar is because i'm not necessarily ready to pick up the sword quote unquote uh for the christian faith um, I don't know. I have my own things about it. I'm a spiritual person, and I don't want anybody proselytizing what they think my God or my goddess should look like. And so I, I don't assume to ever do the same to anybody else. I just can't stand that type of um, dogmatic <laughs> shoving it down people's How throat. Aries of you. Yeah, I, I don't know. I'm it's sort of a though. rebel in that you. sense, so. so I just okay. don't. I, I, yeah. Sorry. Go well, ahead. no, you're cool, dude. I want I want to hear you talk. I'm sure Rafael has questions. Just to sum up, kind of my thinking, if there was a way to sum it up, it seems like, hmm, just like in the Bible, that you had an era where it was like crazy, and then they installed judges, right? And the, like it's like, how do we create order in the chaos of the reality? There is an order ultimately to the chaos, so it's kind of this weird both and toroidal weirdness. But at the same time, like we don't want people just raping and pillaging and doing crazy shit. How can we instill some order to this? I've found that, it, it, like you're saying, it seems the models at the time were very helpful with like a democratic kind of lean uh, votes and all this stuff um, and hierarchy. It doesn't surprise me that these are the kind of uh, reasons uh, that Atlantis 2.0 or America or whatever everyone wants to look at it has these as origins. And I don't think it makes it nefarious particularly, um, but I think in a weird way there is some level – how would I even put it? Um, like – you tell kids not to cross the street and you, you know, you tell them look both ways and all this stuff. At some point you're going to know that yourself, but you have to be taught certain things. It seems like there's a level of that to civil civility and civilization. And that was a presupposition. Maybe this has to do with you guys again. Like we've forgotten what we already knew or something, but um, we've found ourselves in a time when it was very violent, chaotic and um, probably more, um, uh, frightening than we really think of even in terms now like it's not fun to watch planes sm smash buildings or quote unquote or you know covid and all this kind of stuff but like the existential climate at one point was much more ratchet life expectancy was much lower largely probably due to just stress and stuff so in a weird way sometimes it needs there needs to be an emperor card that doesn't or you know in a hierophant card it doesn't necessarily negate the high priestess or the empress card you know the feminine i don't uh, but that's kind of how i've looked at freemasonry where it's like an attempt at some level kind of like the architect in the Ma uh, matrix movies where it's like i'm i'm making this a design i'm d implementing it through logic and reason and it's kind of colder but it's it's going to work whereas you know intuition and feminism is maybe more what you kind of allude to being your personal kind of flavor like more paganistic um nature stuffs and there's a place for that there's a place for both uh but at least when you're building a new reality um on a, you know on the indian burial grounds or whatever the fuck we did here uh it seemed like we had to kind of light um take a light in the darkness of the unknown to ourselves with a sword uh to kind of clear the the jungle overgrowth or whatever and create kind of a safe zone if that makes any sense did we though? I mean, <laughs> if I could be the the devil's advocate here, it's just you know I I am a, a Caucasian person. I'm a white person, and um, I have a direct bloodline to Thomas Jefferson. It's in my ancestry dot com in my tree. It's right down my father's line. He was my great 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 grandfather, and uh, I just you know all the 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 murder and the blood that were build our houses on top of it's just so ridiculous to me um but that this again falls in in line with my daily existential crisis about being awake and what that means and how sensitive that makes you or makes somebody who, who feels awake you know in a way and uh i don't know if all that bloodshed was necessary and that repositioning of people and uprooting of things but we're here now so we might as well uh, dig it up and look at it and mold and model something new out of out of this reality hopefully something that takes 
feminine and divine into conjunction and not one or the other because either extreme is not going to be the right way. And so, totally I mean, concur, yeah, for the record, like we're not living we have in an a ideal capitalist situation. society. No, yeah. I mean, capitalism yeah. doesn't make it's not you're not going to be in tune with nature when you're being capitalistic because it's selfish at that point. So I don't know. I don't know. I think if people uh, want to go to the the Rocky Mountain Mystery School or Freemasonry or f the Ordu Templi Orientis, you know, um, wherever they want to go to find their answers, uh, Kabbalah included, they should, and they should do that to wake themselves up from, from being another of the mass of ignorant people that's guiding this beautiful conscious being that we're able to be blessed to live on, um, and commune with, you know, we're driving her sort of down. <clears throat> but I'm not too worried. I think the Earth has uh, backup plans, and she can shake us all off if she wants to, like fleas on a dog. So, in uh, a lot of ways, we kind of are a plague on this place. So I think any earnest attempt to find light in this day and age, that inner light, uh, that as above, so below, should be praised. And and as long as it takes you to a place where it doesn't hurt anybody else and it doesn't interfere with their own well-being and their spirit and their their calling, then good to go. That's my opinion on it. Exact amount. I'm a very libertarian. I totally hear you. Um, and there, like, it's kind of every. I heard. Uh, I don't know who the Bobby, whatever Baba, somebody from India was saying this at one point. But basically, it's like the uh, gnosis and epiphanies of the West have been. It's our karma to do this. I mean, I don't know where your presuppositions lie. I, Raphael might want I've to talk about this. I've heard that too. I've actually heard that as well from a Christian devotee friend of mine back in the day is uh it, he he said it was negative karma to be born in the west but i actually think um not so negatively about it i think that along the lines of uh we have soul groups and soul consciousnesses and so the people in our tribe that we meet at festivals or wherever you meet that you instantly know your friends and homies or spirit bros or spirit sisters star star people that you know are here to to free up that karmic energy from lifetimes of knowing each other and going through the same crap again. This is maybe Earth 6.0 and we just get our memory wiped every time. I mean, I'm, as I do more and more research into like the depths of fractals and the holographic reality possibility, I, I just think that there is no reason or no way that this isn't a divinely created simulation that we're taking part in. And we sort of jump in, like I heard you talking in the last radio show before we got on today about uh, the life of Roy and Rick and Morty. When I saw that, I was like, oh, smack my head, my forehead, because this is exactly what we are living in, kind of. <laughs> you wasted your 30s watching birds? Kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. It's, he's kind off of, the yes. grid. He's gone off the grid. Totally. No. Uh, Go ahead, Raphael. Uh, yeah, so of course I totally lost my train of thought. Just I wanted to to pick up exactly where I left it, but just keep going. I'll remind myself in a second. Well, kind of what we were talking about is like the kind of conundrum because it's a paradox where it's like we're being birthed through tension and and division and stuff, and it's like like I, I, when I said like America's this great thing, I'm not such a patriot and a nationalist or anything like that that I think there hasn't been it's been rough it's been it's been at the expense of right, the entire nations go ahead so um ian you were talking about uh you know this how you say a daily existential crisis or something to maybe uh <laughs> yeah. ex yes. accelerate that even one step further my still current one of my favorite research topics is tartaria which you may have heard me mention on some other podcast around here as well which also includes the idea of mud flood, of reset civilization, something like, a, let's say, more recent Atlantis potentially, and in regards also potentially again to Freemasonry or what is called Freemasonry, because thanks again for your explanation, and of course it's perfectly clear, just like in pretty much almost any organization, even if one may say ideologically some organizations really have big issues, but usually still most of the people being there really try their best, do their best and are even positive. There's usually always just very few that are the real issue. And then I guess just they gravitate towards organization, which, for example, with Freemasonry may have a degree of secrecy already inbuilt. So that may just be a preferred recruitment or infiltration target, basically. So, um, but that aside, 
Yeah, just to mention uh, Tartaria and also including the idea that potentially many of the so-called Gilded Age mansions, and I call them imperial, like the old-style huge buildings. Today, there are like post offices and uh, justice buildings and all the nice stuff, basically. And Very also neoclassical. And also, if you look historically, there have been like huge so-called hotels then and all kinds of strange structures. I'm not even getting into the world exposition now where supposedly they built up like a huge oh, yeah. area and then tore it all down, supposedly, for the fun or airport. whatever. Yeah, like really strange things. But anyhow, also including the kind of funny pun. And again, not to drag down the whole thing, but just as an explicit case the idea of Freemasonry and then the idea that potentially some of these buildings already were there when America officially got colonized and um, that this was also part of the haha Freemason, that it was just Freemasonry already being there because especially during that oh, time hilarious. you have yeah. you have <laughs> actually very very few people usually even in austria like usually very few architects or something who are credited with basically building everything in record time and that's just something that's a bit strange to me it's physically impossible if you think about it but i think uh i think at this point what bums me out is is so many cultures spent uh, massive resources to burn books and to and to erase and smudge out historical truths and so um, I think why people uh, made things like hieroglyphics and and stuff and hid and hid them in dark caves and places where they would be found in the future is because there was something so important that they wanted to tell the future generations and they knew that scrolls and papyri and and paper wasn't just going to last long enough and oral traditions disappear after a couple hundred years um, and so yeah it's once again another generation looking for symbols and maybe our digital emojis are going to stand out as the hieroglyphics of our future but we will never know but i think there is some there has been nefarious plots i i have definitely heard that a lot of these romanized and doric and ionic buildings were here in america uh, maybe from ancient ancient earlier cultures that came and communed with the natives or the natives came after there's a lot there well, to the unpack question, of course here would be very bluntly put quote unquote what, if anything, would the brothers, quote unquote, have to say about that? If there is anything even uh, in correspondence to that information? Yeah, I think uh, it's, I think each lodge and each grand lodge and I think each brother is so compartmentalized with how they feel about it that, um, and one thing is true is that we don't allow religion or um, politics to interfere in our lodge. So the second a bro starts talking about his religious values or his political affiliations, I'm going to stop listening at that point. I don't, it, it may not agree with me. And uh, there was one situation where a brother wanted the lodge to raise money to send his son to Israel um, on a religious pilgrimage. And there were a couple of people were like, yeah, that's a great idea. And then the rest of us were like, no. That's not what we stand for. If one person has that done for them, then everybody has that done for them, and the, and the, and the rules that uh, are supposed to keep a lodge undivided are broken. So I think that um, plays in, into some of the compartmentalization that happens. So it's really hard to get a thumb on how people across the country, especially affiliated with Masonry, feel um, in this spiritual and esoteric sense. I'm just saying, guys, when I was master of the lodge, uh, I had an opportunity every time that I did a lodge meeting to have an, like a few, like maybe 10 or 15 minutes of an education. So I called the lodge down. I, I made everybody you know, like get up and go out into the ante room and, to where we had a projector. And I literally put on um, slides about what each of our symbols ha has in their deepest meanings and what this meant, like John the Baptist and uh, John the Evangelist, the two patron saints of masonry, had to do with the, the constellations of Capricorn and Cancer and uh, and the, the whole legend of Hiram Abiff is taken from similar Osiris, Osiris death rites, you know, correlating with the sun passing through the 12 signs of the zodiac and, uh, you know, the three three ruffians being Capricorn, Aquarian, Pisces, things like that, and how the, the Pisces vesica was a symbol hidden inside the very square and compass, which is supposed to be a masculine trait. It has to do with the divine feminine. And so uh, when I told my bros this, and a lot of them over, me being the youngest at the time, so I was like 30 in my 
mid thirties, so twenty seventeen. You know, I was like thirty three. And it was a very auspicious number for me to be. <laughs> yeah, I was 32 when I got my 32nd degree. I, I found all sorts of numerological uh, highlights in there. But the point is, uh, to fall back on what I was saying, is that I thought I would open some guys' eyes, some bros' eyes, to what I was seeing. And at the end, one of my brothers was like, so, all right, brother Ian, what are we supposed to do with this information? And I was like, well, I don't know. I'm, I was like, I'm just here showing you what I found, guys. This is what you should be looking for. And, and is it so easy for you, in a sense, to paraphrase, to to accept what's just shown to you? And that's it. You're not going to dig further and dig deeper? I mean, the second I uh, was done with the Blue Lodge, which you're never really done with anyway, because once a Master Mason, always a Master Mason, uh, I joined the Scottish Rite in Bellingham. There's a valley there. They call the lodges their valleys. And they call the state lo uh, Grand Lodges Orients. And so I was at the valley, and, and the, one of the first symbols, and I'm not betraying any secrets by telling you guys this. I'm being mindful of that. But one of the first symbols I saw in the Scottish Rite Lodge was the, uh, the, the Tree of Life, the Sephiroth. And so I was like, okay, I did it. I'm here. I know these guys are on to something good. You know, and then the the next, uh, you know, 28 degrees that unfolded were definitely uh, succinct and on point with what we're talking about as far as teachings and omnism and pulling from every different religion and the symbols that were sacred across multiple cultures um, are still found in Freemasonry. And the pillars of Freemasonry are woven into the tree of the Sephiroth. And uh, one brother and I are even going so far as to diagnose each officer's position in the lodge when they do the little back and forth, sort of like a tennis match, uh, what that means in involved with the Sephiroth as especially Da'ath, the hidden, the hidden orb. And so, um, uh, the patron Saints John and the two pillars, uh, denoted B and J in each lodge have to do with strength and wisdom, um, are also, emblematic of the Kabbalah and the tree of life. And so bringing Severity this to the, mercy. Yeah. Yeah. And I've tried to tell these bros this and a lot of them just don't want to go there. And I don't know if it's cognitive dissonance or, um, bias, but, uh, well, for those of us to see, you know what I mean? Some people, just yeah, aren't exactly. See it. And that's inside the craft. So there's more mystery in the craft that a lot of the brothers won't ever delve into. And there's a few of us that are, uh, sitting there with our eyes open and our ears open and we hear and we see and we're we're waiting for the rest to catch up. Well, that's kind of how it is. I'm totally on that wave. I think, I mean, I don't know. I think there's some term called like um, a, a mason at sight or something, like somebody who's not initiated, particularly in the lodge or whatever, but like you kind of woke and you kind of get it kind of thing. I feel like on that wave, like I've been getting initiated multiple levels through, I mean, when I did DMT uh, back in 2011, long story short, I found myself in a fucking temple talking to fucking Anubis and Isis and having Kundalini activations and all sorts of crazy shit. I don't oh, know yeah. if that's for yep. everybody. Jim, you can't just skip 33 degrees. <laughs> I, I think you can. I mean, some monkeys can, maybe. And that doesn't make monkeys better or worse. I'm not really getting into that point. But I think, I let's put it this way. I think people who are true seekers, you, what you seek is seeking you. You've said that before, Raphael, right? I think that's a roomy quote. Um, Indeed. That's where I'm at with it. I've like, I mean, I'm a double Gemini. I'm a student of life. And I think... One has to respect mystery with a capital M because I think there's some behind the veil things that might not be able to even be actualized or understood in a human conceptual form. Exactly. Yeah. Deep mysteries, like uh, you know, humans. What is a black humans hole? are always trying to. Yeah, I mean, humans are always trying to um, internalize something and find patterns and things and find meanings. For them. We have to know who God or goddess is. We have to. We have to know the math behind fractals and why they're so important in sacred geometry. And I just think that we don't necessarily have to, but we want to. And maybe that um, will get us closer to the divine. But, uh, I mean... I. <sighs> I subscribe to Buddhism and a type of spirituality where that closely resembles pantheism and omnism and all the isms with the Gnosticism thrown in there, and especially the Kabbalah. Give me it all if it, if it sort of speaks to my energetic body and it's something that I familiarize myself with. Um, but it's, it's so hard 
to to say what's right. You know what I mean? And we're still in such a divisive time that uh, I just keep my mouth shut now. I want to wake people up and, and shake people by their shoulders and, and like turn them towards trees and how plants scream when you think about cutting their branches. And, you know, <laughs> animals are aware of us and, and are, you know, it goes so deep. And, and there's a lot of people who just want to stay asleep. And um, just not drink my family. And watch football, all that jazz. Yeah, I got you. Not my not my kids not my wife you know we're all well, on that level way, the whole the whole this gets tricky because this gets into other models altogether and what you're talking about in terms of um syn syncretism like grabbing with the best of from like you know dream rivers are not biblical but they're awesome or yeah. whatever like that kind of shit it's it's basically i honestly think there's a this gets into the hopi prophecies the rainbow warrior and all sorts of stuff like that but i think in some weird way because what is a rainbow warrior it's like colors of the whole thing like light body activation stuff bodhisattva stuff i think there's a crew and i dare i say i mean i don't know your chart but i'm a pluto and scorpio generation that's pluto and scorpio is like death of it's the transformation. I think we're, I mean, this is an apocalypse, whatever we're part of for the past bit minute. And it got really ramp, rampant during the military industrial complex takeover after world war two, which is kind of a tricky time that Eisenhower's like, yo, watch out for these fucking creepy dudes who do yeah, not give a fuck because they'll create their own revenue. They can create their own revenue for war. They don't need to drum the, the drums of war anywhere to Congress and have the people, you know, predominantly decide if we go to war or not. The mil, the MIC pretty much grants, the government the ability to just wage war anytime they want right and here's the tricky part for me okay so what i was kind of saying is like i think that dare i say we've all chosen to be here right now and we're kind of all tap getting tapped and like waking up and all we really have to do kind of like morpheus was there like, let's put somebody woke morpheus up he wasn't the first fucking monkey out of that matrix so he kind of does his thing and neo in that model is like seeking like he's seeking his whole life, passing out, having books like Simulacrum and Simulacrum or whatever, which is basically about simulation theory in a sense, in a philosophical sense, um, and getting into places where not everybody can tread. These are – it doesn't make it, – it's I – mean, how do I even put it? Even in the Jewish temple system, it's like there's a general court where people can kind of trade and do things. There's a, a worship center if you want to put it that way where like jews who say they're jews are going to learn and then there's like a holy of holies which only one dude can kind of go into and talk to the presence of god or whatever which i think i found interesting you said the only thing because i had asked about freemasonry at some point to you and you're like all you have to do is believe in a higher power which it's like nihilists i can't true like you know like yeah i, I can't mean do it. your higher power could secretly be satan if you wanted it to be i guess uh the reality is is that there is a holy Bible uh, in most American lodges, um, at least lodges that may be really rural in the sense that a lot of the city lodges that I've heard it's about like conservative have conservative culture. Yeah, kind of. They have a Torah and a, the Buddhist Book of Living and Dying is available at some lodges as far as the, the volume of sacred law goes. But at my lodge, you know, we had we have just a Bible. And that's why that law that got passed in Washington Grand Lodge of saying – volume of sacred law not just the hb holy bible i was like thank you i don't want to just be you know succumbed or sequestered into some religious dogma just because it's there and the good old boys wanted to remain there and so um i would just omit that divine source whenever i was taking obligation and just i i'm not necessarily a believer in a, a masculine creator god i think it probably more or less has to do with the conjunction of masculine and feminine more hermaphroditic it's ain't soft being. yeah it's beyond duality yeah exactly it's and, and logo, since we are like said, right yeah yep and so there's a lot of uh i still I think i think patriarchy is still clinging by its fingernails to to remain the stronghold in in the country and the world right now and it's just such a shame um <laughs> Well, it's like Star Wars. I mean, look at the movies that are dropping as within, so without. Like the culture is I mean, Hollywood to a large degree is a scrying mirror for us to see our psyche on. I get there's programming and all sorts of weird shit going on. It's not just like an innocent situation necessarily, but at some level, it's a reflection in terms Dude, of the collective there is, consciousness. There is Masonic programming. There's Masonic programming in TV. I've seen it in some of the shows my kids were watching. I was like, I stopped and like looked up from my book, and I was like, What are you watching? What is this? 
how what do you know what that means <laughs> it's like i can't remember the show right now but it was definitely like oh i mean anytime you hear the word on the level or, or square you know or something having to do with that it was like purposely in the in the 1930s and up to the 50s uh freemason jargon was interwoven into our culture to sort of keep that that sort of idea in the back of people's minds um and like you were saying all that jazz a couple times you said it today and i just got done doing the uh uh, dancing and singing in in uh, Chicago at the theater here on Orcas. So it's funny we just did all that jazz. Um, so oh, there's a lot of programming sync. programming that happens. Yeah, and the, the synchronicity is basically, especially reading Young right now. I've been um, really all up in uh, C. Young, psychologist, you know, psychoanalyst, and and the fact that he was as astute as Freud, but split Intuitive. off into the Oh, he was like, he represented that sure divine feminine too. And so I think that, that that marriage of that within Jung was a good way to transmute information to the rest of us, to put it in terms we understand, you know, and I've had experiences sort of similar to what Carl did and where not necessarily a table breaking, but I've definitely um, shared a house that had a shadow person in the house and it, it was, it I guess you could say haunted the house and we had to sort of push that being out with a uh, witchcraft, which a friend of mine came and she was a good witch and a light worker. So I had her clean the house and, and I was part of the ritual there. So it's uh, there's some things happening on this earthly plane that are not necessarily explainable for me. That's why I think my mind is the way it is. And I'm, I don't just think it's all uh, this or that or point blank what it is i think there's some very hidden uh, machinations that happen that many people aren't even aware of and once you open to it and somebody's it personal itself. proclivities might make them more open to it like some people might have the shine so it's not a democratized situation which is the weirdest part about life um we tend to think in a post kind of a democracy you know western idealistic situation that in a weird ultimate way it's a unified thing if the Tao is the Tao, we're all participants we're all witnesses to the Tao, and we're all kind of on that journey so i think we're all on equal footing in that soul level in a way but it seemed i oh, mean yeah. not yeah. every monkey you know it's like x-men wolverine is not jubilee is not storm and everybody's got their own kind of sets of skills and it, it all adds up to a puzzle that makes sense um i i'm sure we can go down some different rabbit holes i don't know maybe right now would be a good time for a music break if you have to pee or get a drink of water or anything I'm good to do whatever, man. I'm sitting here. I'm comfortable. Word, Raphael. Would you like to play music or no? Sure, let's do it. We'll be back in about four minutes. If we were made in his image, then call us by call our us names. By our name. Heady track there. I didn't. I've never heard that. Was that Erica Badu? Of course. Sexy. Uh, I think it's funny that this is the Hanged Man episode, uh, 93rd episode, because in some way I think that's an, an illustration of kind of the process that we go through as individuals. Some of us choose to get on that tree of Idrisel, lose an eye for perspective, uh, and maybe gain a, a, a vision into a, a realm or behind the veil in a way that maybe not everybody is designed to by free will or happenstance or however one wants to describe this ontologically. Um, but those that are seeking will find what seeks them like we just described before uh the break i think it's funny that um it's not surprising you're in aries so it's not and with a moon uh, rising uh i mean a cancer rising in a cancer moon that you're going to be mm -hmm. into kind of mysteries and pursuing the kind of feminine truth in a in a protrusive way like you're going forward into the yoni of life let's put it that way for sure i hope so <laughs> exactly yeah yeah, I, I just being a student of the world, like you put it, is necessary, I think. And I just being open all the time because not everything does have an explanation. And uh, there is a lot of uh, black magic fuckery happening right now. And these people know that they're doing it. And so it takes a lot of the warriors of light, if you want to borrow from so many New Age words, um, to fight that with uh, um, people that have been down dark roads. I've been down dark paths and lives and and our this life and seen horrible attributes in people and so that's helped me to discern from who's true and who's not you know so it's harder to, i guess to t be taken advantage of that way when you have a taste of that and you can fight it when it comes around 
um, with light and love and compassion and understanding and not necessarily reaction. Um, so that's important. And then the rest is all sort of uh, pushing into these mysteries as, as hardcore as I can. But I feel like the more that I, the more knowledge that I'm gaining from all of this, the less I know about the world, as funny as that is. Um, that's the paradoxical sort of like, nature of the bitch. That's how it is. Oh, I mean, even is. in the Matrix, you, you know, like Neo's the one, and he's like, are you the one? He's like, I don't know, man, I'm not sure. Not right. I mean, the one doesn't necessarily know they're the one, and the one that claims they're the one is not the one. So it's it's sort of similar to that. And the person who claims he's a Gnostic is not really a Gnostic. Um, so it's interesting. Um, but the, I have to make notes now and fill up journals and things of my findings and my research <laughs> because my mind just pushes out the stuff that it doesn't deem necessary at that moment. So I can't pull upon as much knowledge at the ready and abstractly as I used to be able to do in my younger years, I guess. But um, I definitely think that all of these ideas and philosophies from the tarot to astrology – to numerology are part and participle of the same truth. And uh, if you want to get into energetic field theory and how we're all connected, I mean, I've, I've gone out of my body before uh, when I was 15 years old and um, I've never been back out there again uh, by myself, my own volition. You know, I've wanted to go into the astral realm again, but it only happened once for me. And, but it was once was enough to prove to me that uh, this was a real place and it was, tangible and time sort of slows down and stops and so what were the conditions you know, done... of that experience oh okay yeah it was lsd for sure <laughs> at 15 yeah that's was, not too young. It, okay okay well i i grew up at uh, i wasn't always on on the island here i grew up in texas and a few other places so i was uh thrown into the real world growing up real quick pretty fast and you know first cigarette at like 12 or 13 and then wheat marijuana was at 13 for me and then uh all these other drugs at 14 15 16 uh just because of the the crew and people that i was with at the time set and setting that was what they did and you couldn't say no to them and i had nowhere to go so i was part of the crew and uh you know what they did i could do better sometimes is what i felt like so I, I, yeah i was opened to uh altered states of consciousness and other realms by 15 and i know it wasn't a trip that i went on I, because I, it was actually a moment that i was freaking out i i was starting to lose touch of reality and i felt this like strange thing basically i laid down on my friend's couch and the second I hit the couch, my consciousness just pushed itself out through my third eye. And and the way I, and then when I came back into my body, it was seven hours later. But it wasn't a dream. There was no courting of a dream-like state. There was no, like, this wasn't an extended trip. It was literally, I think my brain was just like, all right, you've had too much. Get out. And, like, kicked me out so it could do its, its healing on me that it needed to do or whatever. That's funny. So, I'll recant a real quick story. Crazy. Um, hit mute while you're not on this so I don't hear myself looping. Thanks. Uh, it's not your fault. Your new program for you. And speaking of which, that's one thing I'll say before this little uh, story about astral projection that I also have done it once, but I was sober, but it was under very stressful. I mean, I think I was secreting natural DMT. Let's put it that way. But um, we're all programs in a machine at some level. So trying to, the trick, I think, is becoming aware of programmability. And then choosing better or worse programs. What happens is a lot of people are just, um, you know, born into a prison that they're not even aware of or whatever kind of matrix style. And that there's a moment in kind of individuation, it seems, where you punctuate and say, oh, my gosh, it's, you know, black iron prison. And oh, this is all fucking matrix. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. But it's like this is where uh, it seems to be the happening place of the cosmos, at least in a lot of like almost a slaughterhouse five kind of way. It's like this is the party in a lot of ways and of experience of dualistic experience. So, um kind of reintegrating into the programmability and trying to program yourself, it seems like it's part of what the Freemason thing is. It's like, look, you're an engineer. Let's engineer you. Like, you can do this yourself. You've chosen to do this. And not everybody's going to do that. Uh, but anyway, a uh, real quick story. It's funny that you said about astral projection. Uh, if, Rafa, if you've got any stories, I want to hear it too. Um, probably in high school. I think I was 16, maybe 17. Um, basically, I started waking up in 2003 three my uh senior year of high school and for some i had well long story short i had a mushroom trip where i didn't have any like i even ate the mushrooms and my brother and my friend are like seeing shit and all this stuff and i'm not having visuals but i'm having like the pure gnosis of the fractal nature of reality like i was just like oh my god i see it it's like a fucking 
yeah. the water yeah. is the fucking bloodstream is the you know like i wasn't tripping it was just like awareness like in a pure way and it just started fucking with me ask my brother anytime anybody listened to this like if i had a fractal quote-unquote stage because this is pre-youtube and shit and i was just like everything's a fractal and he's like chill on that shit bro and i was like manic about it for a few months <laughs> um, everyone knows well, yeah. Well, yeah. Well, that's the beauty of it. I, I'm glad. And then in a Kashyyyk sense, it's like we're all rising up together. I was not alone, but it, like nobody was talking about this, and I was not mentored or guided or anything. I didn't have the cultural wherewithal to even understand what the fuck was going on. Same, I was going same, to teachers. Here. Yeah, it's not. I mean, in a way, we signed up for that, so that's cool. Like pioneers of the wilderness, like Lewis and Clark style. It's like, oh shit, that's a grizzly. Like as opposed to like some taxidermist back on the east coast of the Smithsonian being like, I have a grizzly bear pelt or whatever. It's a very different situation in the fucking front lines of consciousness it seems but um especially when you're not like initiated by others it was like a self-initiation anyway that mushroom triple say was in september or something and for a few months i'm going to my math teachers and like pastor and stuff i'm like i think i've had the revelation whatever that might mean i'm like i think i see everything as like part of a system and it's this fractal thing and like they just were not they were like yo chill out and one math teacher was like go watch 2001 a space odyssey and easy rider was his advice <laughs> uh so that was kind of cool i ended up reading 2001 the book uh yeah easy red is hardcore in terms of like moral kind of american understanding of reality uh very situated in a it's a time capsule for sure um but anyway long story short i'm being long-winded my bad um i got kind of self-righteous and i was smoking mad weed and i was like i'm done with that shit i'm gonna start running on this treadmill and drinking green tea and only having one tuna fish sandwich they got very ascetic like out of nowhere was reading books on zen buddhism and taoism all in like 2001 space odyssey at the library and basically I was in dual enrollment in high school at the time. So I had free, like, it was like early bird first, second, third done for the day. So, and, um, during like November was like Thanksgiving break or whatever the fucking college. So I didn't have any classes to go to. And I was like, for some reason, this is like guided by the spirit or I don't know how to put this in a way that one might not feel religious overtones, but it was just like, I had this understanding that I had to do some things. So I was like, I'm just going to start running on the treadmill, my treadmill, in my house at the highest level, like on 10, for like an hour or two and listen to one song like G unit or the police sting in the police or whatever I was listening to at the time I put on one track and I just listened to it, get into a super high trance state, um, like sprinting for like an hour or two on this treadmill and just like zoning, zoning, zoning. And then I'd hop off and get in a seated Lotus position and basically get my breathing to the longest measures I could, um, to like music and just thinking my Buddha third eye or whatever the fuck I was thinking. And I did this for like a week or two, like no reason, no, like I, it wasn't like I was, I felt compelled to do it. Let's just put it that way. Uh, and then at the end, of, I was listening to Alan Parsons Project High Robot, which is a dope concept album by the guy who produced Dark Side of the Moon. If you haven't heard, it's funky and about like Isaac Asimov's iRobot kind of concepts, AI and self-awareness. So I'm listening to this mm -hmm. uh, concept album and I straight up sitting there breathing after all this shit, two weeks, three weeks of doing this dumb, rigorous kind of self mutilation or whatever the fuck I'm doing. And, um, I pop up out of my body, astral project. And I wasn't expecting this. I didn't have anybody tell me this is even a possibility, right? Like it wasn't like I, it was not on my radar. So I was like kind of sitting up astrally, my silver body looking around kind of like, cause you're, you're saying you did this in some other kind of abstract way with psychedelics, but it's definitely real folks. You can do this floated around, went to some fucking, I was like, saw earth. I was like, fuck yeah, let's go as far as I can. Got to this like, newest sphere like 4d kind of mental sphere of like see-through mountains kind of like taoist art or something uh, very much like tron in the new F daft punk soundtrack film tron um on the way to shambhala you were oh uh, something right um the outlands where it's just like this holographic kind of not there actually alex gray has a very good image that looks like it like theolog versus these like holographic kind of mountains anyway um, chilling on these mountains, met Jesus there, whatever the, I thought Jesus was. He pointed to a, like kind of this like abyssal situation, and he's like, I went there so he didn't have to, and I slammed back into my body. Very Gnostic experience for me. Um, one of the reasons I'm still a Christian, because it's like, that's not like a felt board Sunday school lesson or something my parents told me. I experienced something very viscerally, whether it's ultimately true or a projection of my programming at the time or whatever, that's debatable. But anyway, um, we are more than we think. But it, this place matters quite a bit, given the circumstances. Kind of the whole point of my saying any of that. Um, For sure, more yeah. There's rules. There's always rules. There's, uh, well, I just mean that they're like it when you put it into terms of um, this is just a holographic reality simulation. People think, oh, well, then we shouldn't take it seriously. No, but there's serious um, consequences and concepts that are are materialized in this world for sure it's like part of the living matrix that we're beholden to the laws of it the natural laws and so i i do think um I, what you're saying is true is that we have we have 
we're not just our physical bodies. I don't think I'm going to die whenever I die. My spirit's going to go back to whatever great source spirit, and maybe I'll be back for Earth number seven with all of you, and you're going to be my my cousin or something, or my brother or my sister. That, Who knows how? Right? It's like uh, if you if you want to think about. Um, coming back into different bodies and, and uh, God, what did, what did Plato call it? Um, Transmigration of the soul. Transmigration of souls. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, uh, it's, I kind of subscribe to a lot of those thought processes as well as the thought process that are um, through the crystallization um, alchemy of DMT, we crystallize our souls into these bodies. And so in a sense, um, our pineal gland is like a radio receiver receiving the frequency to crystallize into this body and experience everything we have. That's why we sometimes project through that uh, third eye. And while so many cultures, including the Pope of this current day, has a staff with a uh, pine cone leading up to a cross on it, you know, and if you th want to think about the cross, uh, the cross is also found in the Tetractus, which is, you know, Pythagorean I want to get the ink, the 10 dots. I do too. Yeah, that's, that's what's but, up. But finding someone who can really do good line work is important to me, so I haven't done that yet. And, and like even Pythagoras was on to the whole... You know, with his Pythagorean why, it was earthly wisdom and divine wisdom. You know, the youth and initiate starts at the base of the spine, if you want to talk Kabbalistically, and works their way up. And then if, um, uh, they reach that split or in the tree that, that goes to divine wisdom and earthly wisdom. And so I think a lot of Freemasonry and all these different rites of passage places have, have modeled their 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 initiations and rituals off of that and uh so I and mean, i don't know it's it's so crazy man i mean even so thinking about all of this and i feel like i'm still scratching on the surface because there's so much unexplained and we may never get to a point in this life with such short amount of years up to 100 or so that we can figure this out and maybe it's not our place to figure this out and that's just us being humans wanting to figure it out because we're you know, gnashing our teeth trying to find the answers. It can't just be us like, in the universe. Like, there's no answer. I don't. I think that's the weird thing. It's like, okay, so I, I hear you. Where you're not a natural material reductionist. I don't think any of us in this room right now are. Uh, we're all pretty spiritual, but that is because of the phenomenological experiences we've had. It's not just because someone tells us we have a spirit. We've had gnosis for ourselves, for our own understanding, and Something that inner sanctum. Yeah, dude, and it's crazy. When you're saying Ta Solomon's Temple, you're building your inner Solomon's Temple, I think not everybody initiates into doing that. Some people just want to kind of like – and it's in a weird way I have to pull back and say that's their karma, that's their choice. You know, They get to choose a red pill or not. They get to choose if they want to be Neo or just like Siler basically and like ignorance is bliss. It's out. so true, yeah. Yep, it's so true. You're you're associating it with the Matrix, and in a lot of ways uh, that movie hit the nail on the head with um, metaphorical – uh, ideas about what's happening in this reality and and once you take that pill though to wake up man and i've said it time and time again since i quote unquote opened my eyes um you can't really go back to ignorance after that point so so it's, everything is uh, a new revelation every day that you wake up and can experience the mysteries of life again it's, it's crazy and um, yeah, I think uh, Freemasonry is great, and and so are all the others, though. You know, all those other um, Thelemic magic practices, and um, I don't even care about the Satanists. They can do. In fact, one of the, I know, I've known one Satanist in life many years ago, and I don't even think that they thought that they were truly a Satanist or understood what that meant. But I think their whole main line is like what Eliphas Levy said, which or Aleister Crowley, that Thy will be done. You know, Thy will is the whole of the law. And they just want to be free to do what they want to do with, and not be proselytized uh, to about other religions. This is the so 93rd I episode. Just... I think it's funny that's coming up because at the end of the day, like I'm not a left-hand pather. I'm not into Crowley particularly. That's not my flavor. I think just like Anakin can go kill a bunch of Padawans and get dark energy stuff. It's like there's other ways to do that. You can kind of be Yoda and chill about it. I'd much prefer that. Um, but at the end of the day, we are all necessarily doing what we want. Like that is what's happening. We are ob we are observers in a in a neutral kind of holographic reality that influence the dimensional kind of coordinates of the multiverse that we're in, and we experience the lessons we need. And then it's like it's almost like group solipsism is how I always put it, where it's like you are. I mean, I kind of live between two uh, 
mantras, if you want to put it that way, all you touch and never, all you touch and all you see is all your life will ever be, which is a Pink Floyd line, which is like existentialism, oh, yeah. essentially. You know, it's like yep. I can't tell you what being a black woman is like, or you know, uh, you know, transsexual, or I, those aren't my reality tunnels, so I can't really speak into those things. But at the same time. Uh, Neil Young says there's more to the picture than meets the eye. Having that humility, understanding that my perspective isn't the perspective and kind of living in that tension allows me to kind of move freely. But, Raphael, you've been kind of quiet. I'm kind of curious as to what your perspective is on um, just, you know, being in in, uh, a diamond in the lotus or something. Something. (laughs) Kindly be slightly more specific. Well, I think what happens, maybe I'm tripping because let's just say this COVID situation, I, I, I mean, I'm into astrology. We had this massive uh, Capricorn and uh, or Saturn and Pluto conjunction in Capricorn, which is about institutions. Um, the North Node was in Cancer and now it's in Gemini. Um, just a lot of things happening in the zeitgeist and at an and 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 energetic level as above um, that are having ramifications on the programming of the as below, really, quite frankly. And a long story short, the patriarchy is kind of coming to its end. Um, it's a tower card moment. Trump Tower. I mean, that's not a joke. And I'm not into QAnon or into Trump. I did not vote for him. Right. Um, but, like, he seems to be a harbinger of change in a way that is actually going to be putting a fucking, you know, baseball bat into the moving wheel, uh, you know, bicycle tire or something. It's like, this is this is how it starts. Like, this is the edge of a black hole. Like, post-2012, I think very strongly, and I think Brett... Uh, Joseph, Gemini Brett, thinks the same thing. I don't know how you feel. Sounds like you started getting initiated and stuff at 2012. That was a very much a threshold of an event horizon that we're now kind the of the end of the crossed. Mayan long count calendar. Yeah, exactly. That was when every, everybody thought the world was going to end that year, and then the next day we were like, oh, it didn't end. And uh, that's when we sort of realized that 2012 was sort of the uh, big awakening for another group of generation of people, uh, healers or light workers or people just to wake up and say, Hey, there's some weird shit happening. And I'm pretty sure people plan this weird shit by their, by going into a star room and judging when Mars is triune or, I, you know, see, I'm not an astrologist, but I, I have heard these things. <laughs> Jim and I, Brett and I were talking once about the fact that, uh, some congressional members and statesmen, do what the ancients did and talk to an astrologer before they plan their big moves or their money making moves and and uh, it sounds hokey. Quincy to a lot Jones of people. does it. Yeah, dude. It's right. Like it sounds really like it sounds like woo woo, but at the same time, uh, you can almost count these events or, or coordinate them with astronomical events sometimes, and that's too much of a coincidence. I think there are no coincidences. Right. I mean, I'll say this, and then I'll clarify kind of what I was asking, Raphael astrology is essentially it seems the algorithmic clock of a lot of levels of things that doesn't mean it's the whole truth and nothing but the truth like i don't know if aries was an archetype to crow magna man i don't know in ten thousand years if we'll be dealing with these things like it seems at some level a condition of the Tao that we reflect in our consciousness and therefore we like kind of marshall McLuhan or a boris feedback loop into so it's like we're aware of these stories and archetypes we grow through them etc cetera, etc cetera. i wouldn't be surprised if like um you know galactic levels of things start kicking on with the age of aquarius when jupiter entered sagittarius a year and a half two years ago that's when i started being even willing to concede the idea of star seeds and stuff before then i'm like i don't believe in aliens and if there are aliens i'm afraid of them and now i'm like oh shit i'm probably a star seed blah blah blah, blah. like it's totally different vibes I don't think these conditions of the Tao were going to be happening before 2012. Um, it's kind of like the soup is what it is when you make it, and some soups and wines take a little longer to age. We're in a, in a, I don't even know, like a crib or melting something, pot. a consciousness. Melting pot. Or Young would say, yeah, we're in a soup cooking ourselves or whatever, right? So it's like this is just Pretty this much, big yeah. alchemical apotheosis. Um, we're all one big thing experiencing itself individually and then learning through the kind of um, like a coral reef is like a mass consciousness of, nodes it's kind of like that where it's, it's like, like it's one an big osmosis thing. that happens or the hundredth monkey syndrome of generation of humans when maybe so many uh as far as parameters go so many of the humans awaken it causes a paradigm shift and that's sort of like the hundredth monkey where uh, 99 monkeys were washing their fruit in the river and finally when the hundredth monkey did monkeys of that same kind all over the world were doing that almost in a form of osmosis where there was no way they could have translated that information to each other other than by some Akashic method or some su- supernatural way or superluminal way, whatever you want to call it. Right. Language fails. Quite frankly. I'm a double Gemini with Chiron and Gemini, so language does fail at some point because when we say like metaphysics or supernatural, it's like 
you know, any technology undiscernible to us is magic, right? Kind of thing, uh, Arthur C. Clarke style. Exactly. So, yes. Yes. So we're in a, like a machine of consciousness experiencing it in a holographic way, but like that, that has conditions just like in a video game, like Mario, the first level is like, go get that, f- hit that square, get the coin, go get that mushroom, go down to the basement. If you want and see these like, you know, Goombas or whatever, uh, come up, get the flag. By the time you get to Bowser, it's a very fundamentally different like nature of the game. Long story short, recently the astrology has been such that it's like Bowser's are like, I mean, this is the whole David Icke situation coming out recently saying, you know, just all levels of things. This wouldn't have happened before the internet. This wouldn't have happened before kind of the temperature of the room was at a certain place. Like now we're having, like, you know, you can't have mushrooms grow kind of in a Terrence McKenna stone ape theory. Um, mushrooms have to have certain right. conditions. Yeah. Like desertification fucks it up. And that's why we might've switched from, you know, mushroom cults to like alcohol cults basically, but to solar worship cults. Yeah. Yeah. You get what I'm throwing down, but so like the conditions change and that means, you know, in a Merovingian matrix kind of way, it's like cause and effect. That's very much the Buddhist thing, right? It's like cause certain causes have certain effects. Crowley said that. It's like if you do certain things, certain things will follow. <laughs> it's just like how it works sometimes. That's a level. It goes so, so, you know, below the surface of it, your first waking thoughts could dictate your energy for the day. And those people that come around you are like the Buddha said, uh, if you're an angry person and you're walking around just normally, somebody could come up and just punch you for no reason. But that's because you're, it's the law of attraction. You're attracting that, inf- that vibe to you. And so I think a lot of them, people are purposely kept neutral uh, with TV and television programming and, and, uh, the curriculum in the schools is, you know, they don't want you to ask questions. They don't want you to be individualized thinkers. Uh, this is a, this is part of the old playbook that's been happening actually for probably 40 or 50 years. And I mean, I'm only 35, but I'm awake enough to be like, hey, man, we're the wool's being pulled over our eyes. And and a lot of subversive ways of look over here while this here is happening over here. But don't look at this. Look at that. And um, uh, it's like. There's an old expression having to do with the crown and the tiara and the church and how the the mob of people are the ones that um, execute the punishment uh, because we're followers. And so I think... Uh, well, it's the whole Dionysian yeah, it's myth hard. or whatever. I mean, if you've read Manly P. Hall and the Secret Teachings of the Ages, there's a moment oh, where it's yeah. like very occulted stuff where it's like, yo, like this guy gets torn up by the ignorant masses. Yeah, so that's right back to Osiris again and his being torn to pieces. And yeah. Same as it ever was, as David Byrne would say. Very fam- – my favorite Scotsman probably. Um, it's funny because I I heard this before, uh, Raphael. Um, I totally spaced on what I was going to ask. I just wanted you to kind of throw in some Bashar raw material stuff because you're good at that. And I'm like, uh, you, you hear what we're talking about. But one quick thing and then I want to kind of see where Raphael's head is at uh, if he has any questions kind of thing. Um Yes, maybe Freemasonry has at one level kind of there's – it's almost like quantum – we're in a quantum age. That's post-modernity. Like we cross into a place now where it's like it isn't binary. It's both and. It's wave and particle. We're aware of that. So there's a simultaneity and that cognitive dissonance can – much like in 2001 A Space Odyssey, some monkeys touch the obelisk, some monkeys don't. And if you touch the obelisk, you go onto a trajectory where you end up on the moon. And you, if you're those monkeys touching that obelisk on the moon, you go to Jupiter. It's like it's, it's an initiation for those who seek – um, but Mason and French, where, I mean, I'm not sure about the whole lineage, but I'm pretty sure Freemasonry kind of has some level of uh, French history. Um, Mason means house or building. And, like, not that free is exactly like Libre is free. And, like, in French, it's not a direct translation. But I think what happens is people who start Buddha awakening, like, because Buddha means awake. It doesn't, you know, it means I'm awake to the situation. I'm, I'm cognizant. I can see it for what it is. Um and I don't think he thought he was better or worse. He was just like, I found a way to fucking unlock my potential. And I could build my own Solomon's Temple, my own house. And I could show you guys how you've been maybe constructing through cultural inheritance or genetic inheritance or karma or whatever. And there's ways to kind of nullify this and and be your own programmer. I mean, that's ultimately what we're trying to do because we're in some kind of electrical thing. I've seen some great memes before where it's showing like Egypt from above. And then it's like showing like, you know, like a motherboard or something. And it's just like, y'all, like we are conscious conduits of energy. Like you were saying earlier, biochemical computers. And that is an analogy that breaks down and becomes kind of existentially weird at some point. But it's like we're in a simula- simulation of, of consciousness and meat suit experience. We're, these are the most fully engrossing um, 
you know, VR suits you could ask for. It's like we have full sensory VR experience. Meat. Yeah, meat suits for sure. So, um, Raphael, you hear kind of where I'm going with all this. What are your two cents? And if you need me to be more specific, I will. But I, I feel like you have nuggets that I, I'm not specifically digging for, but I know that are there. Okay, well, <clears throat> I just have a different question uh, for uh, Ian. Basically, uh, whether you're familiar with uh, Albert Pike's uh, Morals and Dogma, because there he's also specifically getting into this whole idea of let's say, the deliberate confusion, something along the lines that only the princess-elect shall truly be led into the inner courtyard. This may now be seen as a you know smart way, like the Zen master does it, not to be disturbed, or in a nefarious sense in terms of you know people deliberately uh, getting confused. But you kind of actually already uh, discussed that whole idea. But and there's another aspect, if we say now we're on the same wavelength, obviously, in terms of basically sharing information, like, let's call it X-share. There is the apparently prophecy, let's say, by uh, Rudolf Steiner from about 1906. And apparently back then he was releasing all his material and said, okay, uh, whatever, let's just publish everything we can because and a few other uh, anthroposophist writers at that time saw the same issue. They basically realized that scientific uh, reductionism and materialism in a bad way is slowly taking over. And they said, okay, we release everything now, basically to kind of save, I don't know, the Gnostic flame, however you would want to put it. And also at that point, he said... Gotta keep that yeah, but he said that also at that point, if we don't manage now, and obviously they didn't, because what came afterwards was like oil and scarcity business, you know, to the power of square something, square, uh -huh. um, <laughs> um, and then he said, okay, if we don't manage now, then in a hundred years, we will have another chance. And this would be right around the time right now. So let's say about 2016. And I'd be interested into as what your view is. And even in terms of life expectancy, I'm kind of interested because we were talking about 100 years. Maybe some are familiar with the different lifespans presented in the Bible. And at least with things like C60, we even have already publicly available tools, let's say, where we may greatly be able to extend our life. And while I'm totally on the wave of, you know, not like the Skeksis in Dark Crystal, needing to extend my life because I'm completely with you, you know, we're much greater than this. And when we choose to leave, it's going to be for a good reason and it's going to be just fine. But especially also in considering that we want to even potentially, let's say, quote unquote, build civilization, shouldn't then life extension in the most, let's say, healthy and uh, vital way also be one of our core interests potentially even even just to have the time to understand just as you mentioned yeah totally um that was a lot to process for sure but i get it and albert pike is one of those gentlemen scholars of masonry that uh, a lot of our um, rituals especially for the scottish rite are based off of his rituals that he re um, initiated into this craft. He, he brought him up from the old French Masonic. Uh, so, Jim, you're right. French Masons were, are a big deal and are interwoven in, into our craft in a variety of ways and a variety of the higher up degrees. And uh, Albert Pike, I did, and I do have several copies of uh, Morals and Dogma. And um, it it's hard to read, I, I like reading. I'm a writer, so I can read college level and even some very whimsically written linguistic uh, exercises, I should say. Finnegan's but, um, Wake. Yeah. Oh, not even just Finnegan's Wake. I was reading something the other day. It was uh, it was just some a doctor of linguism or linguistics, I should say, um, wrote this academic paper. It's called Incessance. You can look it up, Incessance. And the whole thing is just so confusing, but a uh, brilliant piece of work. And Albert Pike is in a lot of ways um, as very lengthy and broad in his descriptive terms. And it's really boring to read if I want to just be really frank about it. Uh, but I do um, admire some of the attributes that Albert Pike pointed out. But um, the reality is for me, I think Manly Palmer Hall was closer to getting with the intuitive side of Freemasonry where Albert Pike was just going like, guys, your rituals are crap. Let me just give you the real stuff. And here's what I feel about it. And so Pike so, is the Freud to Manly P. Hall being the young. 
bingo. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Totally. And and Pike is still like a you know ever present reminder of uh, how to scrutinize your ritual and make sure it is um, it is able to be understood by the candidate because we do need the candidates to understand some aspects of what we're saying so it doesn't just go over their head completely. And yes, there is a, I forget which degree. I'm actually looking at a book right now that has a lot of Pike in it. Uh, when you become a Scottish Rite Mason, you have the ability to become um, sort of more knowledgeable by taking a program called the Master Craftsman Program, and it's a series of quizzes that they, they mail, snail mail to you. And I've taken part in quite a few of them, so I'm well on the way to receiving some whatever this, I don't know what it is, some degree, if you will. In some Air 5, some High 5. Yeah, I, like, yeah I don't, dude, I, you're I, in. I don't even care, really. I just want the the access to the knowledge. So I have it in a, uh, one of the books. is called A Bridge to Light by Rex R. Hutchins. And it's a study in Masonic ritual and philosophy. And it, like, you know, it's got everything from the Pythagorean Tetractus to the Kabbalah and, um, and Pike as well. So Pike did contribute a lot to the craft. I would say that I probably, if I were in the same room as him, though, um, he probably wouldn't like me and how open I was with my uh, understanding of things and my reasoning. And he, I would probably think he was too old school for my liking anyway. Um, but, you know, there was that contribution that he made. And I have a couple different books from Pike. I, I wouldn't say his is the end all be all word on Masonic stuff. And I'm pretty sure that's just his like opinion, man. If I was to quote the dude from the Perfect. book of Perfect. That's but, one of my um, favorite movies. Good job. Oh yeah, my, mine too. And but Manly P, he just hits the nail on the head every time I think about the symbols and what they mean to me as a person and as a spiritual person, um, and and how to delve deep. And you know, I it's hard to say. I I don't have the answer for everybody. Uh, I just think as long as people keep seeking and keep uncovering these things and then keep teaching them to other people who are like minded and to ourselves. That, <laughs> Yeah, of course to ourselves. We have to remind ourselves. And just to, to circle back real quick, it's funny how all these psychedelic experiences, I mean, I've done everything from ayahuasca to, to DMT to salvia to LSD and stuff. So I've been across the board with it and I've been a psych, very much a psychonaut in my early years. You're team rabbit so, I knew it. Oh, yeah, bro. I'm, I'm, I'm way down there. I'm sitting there on the mushroom smoking that hookah with, you know, the caterpillar dude or whatever it was. <laughs> I feel like the caterpillar is so, Raphael and the Cheshire cat or some shit. <laughs> so the reality is is that um, I have seen this matrix with my eyes. And although I was under the influence at the time of various things, including ayahuasca, that that was the same vision I saw every single time. It was like a matrix or a lattice, uh, a lattice work, like a web work that was vibratory and, and made noise you know if you could hear it it was like wah 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 and it's very much frequency and vibration and so there's no there's no way to refute in my eyes the fact that we're part of this so um what were we talking about Raphael about pike that was one of those things that he ended up asking you a question about like rudolf steiner life expectancy and stuff Oh yeah, that's right. Okay, so yeah, with CRISPR technology and with with all this gene editing oh, that happens, that, that, that's not the that's not the road I'm talking about, but that's fine. <laughs> okay, yeah, but like you said something about C60. Is that right. isn't that olive oil, olive oil or something? Well, that's it's usually dissolved in olive oil. Here, this was usually, okay, uh, or, um, but it's the right one. This was uh, initially found Buck, as an industrial Buckminster lubricant. Right, exactly. And just super antioxidative oh, okay. and showed in a study with rats, like in crazy increase in life expectancy. For sure, because, well, if you want to think about it, I've heard this before and it made kind of uh, good sense to me. What if the fact that while we're here, oxygen is really just killing us? It just takes 70 to 100 years to do so. And it does so by uh, producing the production of free radicals in your skin, which get, which hunt for oxygen in in your cells and deplete it and that's uh, a mind fuck. part gemini it is because we're already dead at 2012 it's like that level of mind fuck. i'm like what if oxygen oh yeah us? oh my god 
Exactly. Yeah. And, and so I actually, um, I'm the purchasing director for a cosmetic raw materials distribution company. It's actually a company that my mother owns. So it's a family business and it's come quite the global Shut up, Mom. Con- Shut up, Mom. contender. Um, I won't name drop on here or anything, but we craft lotions and we don't really craft anything. Um, but we supply people who do. And so one of the things we do supply is ingredients to, uh, help prevent damaged by free radicals and so so and those are anti-aging ingredients so sure if we could unlock those secrets that'd be great would you really want to live 200 to 300 years i don't think i would to be honest i i want to go to the other side you know i got friends and family over there well me too but if we turn it around here within let's say 20 to 30 years i'm good with staying a few more hundreds you know (laughs) i guess so yeah i guess For sure. If there was a golden age of philosophy or some commingling of science and spirituality, which has been talked about for hundreds and thousands of years back to the Atlanteans who probably had that technology. And, you know, the the word is that they caused the cataclysm of the great party or whatever. Yeah, right. Um, I've read all this stuff, man. My my fingers and eyes and ears have been involved in all every every bit of conspiracy theory to radical philosophies to and i i love it man it's just we're trying to figure it out you know we're not we're not satisfied with what's going on if if my bro over there is hurting how can i be happy you know it's like that whole experiment in africa that this british guy did where he he put like this prize and of chocolates and stuff in, at the base of this tree and had the kids in a big circle around the tree and said, the first one of you to get it gets the candy. Yay. And they all held hands and they all walked into the middle of the, in the circle. You know, it's like, why would we want, why would we, one of us want one thing and lavish it while the others are suffering. And so I think this whole situation where not everybody's awake yet is probably part of the plan. It's, it's for two of us. dude. I mean, yeah. it seems to where we are, and just not hint, hint. I mean, my presupposition is that we are most definitely heading into a golden era. Raphael might be able to speak more explicitly about that because of some of the stuff he's been into. I don't know if you're into reading Daryl An- or you know, Bashar, who's channeled by Daryl Anka, or any of this stuff. Um, I'll say I have one heard thing. a bunch of Bashar on YouTube. Yeah. Oh, perfect. So you kind of get that's the flavor Raphael's coming coming in hot with. Um, one thing I'll say really quick, and then I kind of want to hear Raphael, like, if you're going to spin this, not in a positive way, but like, how can we kind of view it from your perspective at best? Um, because I know we talk about it a lot, but obviously, Ian, this is his first time in the hot seat. So maybe, I don't know, maybe you could throw a nugget at him that might hit him in a in a good spot. Um, but ironically, so Team Rabbit Hole came about because long story short, I was eating a lot of acid, listening to like Alan Watts and McKenna lectures and Daft Punk and fucking around on Facebook back in 2014. And at some point I was making hashtags like singularity or bust and silly things like that. And uh, at one point I made Team Rabbit Hole because it's like the royal we, like in a Big Lebowski sense. And we're all going down this fucking initiatory path together, whether we're awake about it or not. We're all on this fucking boat, uh, you know, the boat across the sea of, you know, uh, the Osirian boat of Ra or whatever the fuck it is. Um, we're doing this thing together. We were, we're embarked, right? Here we are. Um and the first fucking post I ever made in T Rabbit Hole, if you go back, I have this meme page. It's got like, you know, 10,000 followers, whatever the fuck it is now. Um, the first fucking post is Manly P. Hall's initiation of the pyramid. Like, I had just turned on to that on acid or something. I was like, this is what's up. Oh my God, it's blow, it's a blow. Oh, here we go, here we go. And nobody gave a shit about it. So I decided drug memes were the way to kind of tickle people up to awareness and myself included. But, um, Raphael, give us kind of a quick synopsis or any kind of, I don't know. Zen Cohen or anything you think appropriate um, in terms of where you see things are in terms of the game, the checkerboard of duality and the game we're playing um, and maybe the the destination of consciousness uh, uh, given the zeitgeist presently. Well, as we have discussed on the show, it's the apocalypse, which is amazing and awesome and can be most positive. And aside from that, I would just ask, I mean, uh, I'm already afraid of saying it wrong. It's Ian. I, 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 no, Ian, Ian. Um, it's Ian. It's Ian. Ian. E- you European. I, you. That's an E. It's our e, fault. English. It's an what I. have we done? Yeah. Yeah. You should have adopted German. I heard there was a vote at some point in America and they almost passed German for the state's official language. So just by the way. Um, <laughs> oh, I knew that. Yeah. Funny. Man of the High Tower or Man of the High My mother was shit. born, my mother was born in Heidelberg, Germany, actually. Interesting. 
Okay, so here we go. So um, you already pointed it out in terms of, you know, the all being one and the seeking aspect and so on. And then I would just ask myself, everyone can ask themselves, okay, then I can be aware now I already sent myself here. I have decided that these and these ideas are interesting and these experiences. And then overall, I can choose, let's say, the story arc or something. And then if I just look at this logically, including all the potential, you know, pain and suffering and not so comfortable things, pretty much anyone <clears throat> listening probably had to quote unquote endure or chose to some extent then you're like okay what's the grand scheme here gonna be now and at least for myself and for this life i can say that to the extent that i have a choice in it and unfortunately i believe we have up to an ultimate choice each unto themselves then i will most certainly choose the you know absolute transformation of this society and you know, the entire planet in consequence, but just because human perception will be shifting. But yeah, I mean, what else? And it's true that there have always been, you know, prophecies here and there. Then I'm like, okay, who if not you or us? And when if not now? Uh, and I actually think even looking at the quote unquote circumstance, this may very well greatly turn out, let's say in the X share in terms of sharing the knowledge, light, favor. I, I mean, it. I hope so. Go ahead. I want to, I wasn't always, um, or I should say, I haven't always been, uh, what's the word, um, positive Op about, optimistic. a pessimist. Yeah, I haven't always been an optimist, but I haven't, and I did for a long time remain a pessimist because of things I've seen in life that were just, that they destroyed my view of humanity and, and what people were capable of. Uh, but then as, you know, meeting my wife and a few other people that I call tribe, I got back into the whole um, optimism thing. And, and the reality is, is uh, I would like there to be a radical transformation as well. I don't think it's going to come about violently. I think there there's um, contingency plans to thwart that violent uprising and it's probably not going to benefit the message that people want to get out. Uh, I also think that um, the call to action is buried in the minutia of everyday life, unfortunately, in the everyday life of memes to TV to TikTok to Instagram. And that's a shame. Uh, but at the same time, it's part of the newosphere that that was talked about. Uh, where it's this age of information and knowledge that is so accessible and at the ready that it is like the physical manifestation of the Akashic record. And we have that now with the internet. And um, all systems are capable of corruption. So if you keep those things in mind and everybody has this common goal to benefit everybody and not just themselves, armed with historical information and the desire for positive change can't be a bad thing. Awareness and compassion at the highest degrees combined. Why not? Like that sounds like a golden age to me. Um, I think what's coming to mind, uh, just in kind of, because uh, I do want to talk about music for a second. We haven't really talked about your DJing, um, and we got to. I mean, we got as long as you want, but uh, I'm sure at some point you're going to be like, I have a life to live. I got to go. Um, it seems in terms of Freemasonry, there's a quote I heard before in terms of basically, you know, communism or Christianity or anything. It's like, don't let a philosophy uh, don't judge a philosophy by its adherence all the time. So I think there's been some people within certain circles of reality, whether it's Freemasonry or not, who have maybe kind of played the game selfishly and done weird things, and that's their karma. We'll figure out why. Like Judas has to pull a trigger for there to be a crucifixion, so that maybe some people have to play a bad role for things to go forward in a certain philemic kind of thinking for sure um for sure yeah, yeah it's like i don't know I, I, the catalysts like, we've talked about that before um and manly behold secret teachings gets into a point where um he's talking i mean Raphael could probably sync it up better than i can but, but long story short like stubbing your toe against the devil because that makes you raise your foot to get to the next level or whatever it's like that, that, <laughs> that's you know great what I, mean? I love that like, like obstructions cause us to to try differently it's and the chapter on the Kabbalistic keys to the creation of man, if you have it on photographic memory for some reason, where, he's to, where Adam is going back to the Garden of Eden, is confronted with a snake who turns into an angel, who turns into God, basically, and tells him, I have been the tempter who have, has achieved your salvation because I have weaned thee of desire, and so on and so forth. 
five fifty five yeah. here, but of course, no, I I think that's nice. the hardest pill to swallow. Where it is this kind of detached thing, hold on loosely in a Buddhist sense, where it's like, y'all, this is a weird dualistic kind of game. And there's stakes, but the stakes are awareness. It's uh, I read the Emerald, or heard the audiobook of the Emerald Tablets of Thoth, which if it's fiction, it's the fucking Lord of the Rings 2.0. And if it's fact, it's like, holy tits, this is amazing. But the point is, we're like, we all just have to shine a light on the way, right? The gnosis, the, that, that flame of the interior, stoke that fire, however that looks to you, whether it's, you know, sitting around singing Kumbaya and eating drugs, or if it means going to Freemasonic lodges, or if it means circuit searching the internet for Morpheus, or whatever the fuck it means for an individual. Well, I just gotta say, guys, I don't find a lot of those, um, what should I say, realizations in the Free, Freemasonic lodge. I'm not trying to betray my brethren or anything worldwide, but um, I found a lot of these truths um, in the periphery. And so that was just in life and in my psychedelic experiences and in other organizations like the Rosicrucians, which I've also been a neophyte in as well. Um, so it's masonry is not also doesn't have all the answers, just like ayahuasca doesn't have all the answers when you're going into it to cure yourself of whatever. And so, um, yeah, I think uh, gnosis, knowledge is important. And I don't have advice for anybody other than to keep on your path and you don't hurt me and I won't hurt you and we're good to go. And everybody's walking each other home. That's the truth. Ram Dass got but, uh, it. R.I.P. Uh, yeah, I could segue into my music for a sec. Um, my phone Dolphin. is dying and that's what I'm using as the primary transmitter here, but it's okay. Um, I actually started as a DJ in 2001 with two turntables and 50 records and I had started with UK Hardhouse and Energy as just a baseline to get my to train myself how to match beats and then I uh spent 5 or 6 years learning that and then um another 2 or 3 years being a drum and bass DJ specifically and so drum and bass and jungle are very much in my soul and and I love drum and bass and jungle and and it's like riding a bike anytime I DJ it I can I can whip up a good set and um music for me is like very much uh plays into that whole particle and wave and that uh, shamanism through music is what I call it and that's my way to connect to people through my soul and spirit and so I don't have a website or anything. I just go by Bodhi Saifa and you can find it on SoundCloud and, and MixCloud and things like that. But um, I, it was priority in my life to be to be distributed widely and known as a DJ and producer uh, a few years ago. But then my priorities changed and I care less about that now. And uh, I do love my music and, and I think it's an aspect of my soul and part of my soul's voice that you can feel. And I like using analog and digital equipment like my Roland MC-909 and my machine studio. Um, but I don't know. It's it's kind of tough. I, I've DJed almost all of the Imagine Festivals because Darren's a good friend of mine and he, he knew I could DJ really well. And so he had faith in me. So I've done a lot of the openings. I've done silent discos. I did the yoga studio and uh, one of the DJ sets I did. It wasn't the last time that you and I were there, Jim, but it might have been. I, I played three or four original tracks, and a lot of my music is different. It's not formulaic, and I've purposely tried to stay away from formulaic stuff. I mean, maybe that boom, boom, snap, boom, boom, clap may be a little tiny bit formulaic, but that's just to to get the bass line going. You have to have the, parameters. The, the I rhythm. Mean, there's rules. You have to I do have the rhythm, yeah. And so uh, my music's weird, and a lot of it's anticlimactic, and, and it, I very much... I'm imagining myself in an ambient energetic environment when I'm producing. So, uh, but my production is different than my DJing, my DJing, I'll go to, from house music to disco, to, to rap, to everything. I love all the music and, um, my production stuff is more akin to world ethnic down tempo, crazy stuff. Right. I'm a any, Philip Glass Anybody fan. I can it compare it. I, I appreciate it's minimalistic. I mean, it was very much like Henry says, but like a little more kind of explorative texturally. Um, it was developmental. And it, like you're saying, it wasn't climactic. Like there's these huge swells and drops and all this crazy shit. It wasn't, didn't feel like that. It was more just like, it felt like it has a trip where it was just kind of like flowing forward infinitely at a calm pace. 
like good clean acid or whatever. It felt like that, where it's just like, oh, here we go, here we go, here we go. For sure. I love that. I love that you say that about it, because anybody's interpretation of my music, I love to hear. <laughs> Oh, we'll talk about it more. I know your phone's dying. Um, I don't know. We'll have to keep in communication. I definitely would love to help again with the Imagine stuff. I don't know how that'll work. Um, but it get, uh, with well, COVID who knows now with COVID and everything? It's um, such a strange reality we live in, and I I hope there's some semblance of normality that comes back. But the reality is, is if you think and look back on history, every hundred years or so, there's a bad virus like this. And it's almost like it's the cyclical nature of the virus itself to overcome our immunities. And who knows, or it could be part of the whole Georgia Guidestones and 444 and or 40,000 people left, and that's easier to control. Who knows, man? I, I The reality is, is I think um, people need to be careful how many eggs they put in their proverbial manifestation basket right now hold on they, Leslie. yeah they need they need to be careful of where you're putting your energy to because that will dictate your karma and, and what you have in this life and and everybody's got it right and everybody's got it wrong and once again human beings trying to humanize and put a language to something that has no language it's so incomprehensible it's ineffable it's unpronounceable and um i think we can feel it better than we can describe it and I've been, thousand percent. I, thousand percent. yeah, I've, I can feel you, man. I feel your energy, your vibes, and you're in Colorado and Raphael, I'm pretty sure, aren't you in, uh, uh Austria or, or Germany or something? Vienna. Austria, yeah. V Vienna. Yeah. So it's, it's, there you go. I, I can feel your vibes guys. You got, you got good vibes and I hope to be part of that and unfolding. And I think that there's more community in this world than we realize and that the powers that be want us to feel alone. Because there are powers that be that do want to see the destruction as long as it benefits their coffers and their profits. That's what the last Star Wars movie is all about. I mean, I don't know if you're into Star Wars, but basically, long story short. Oh, no dude, spoilers. I'm a great Jedi all the way, man. Uh, there you go. I mean, it's like the whole point with like, you know, Poe being like, yo, Ran Lando, how did you figure this out in the fucking first iteration against that Emperor, the Emperor then? And it's like, you got to find the others. McKenna Leary style. Find the others. Send out, the, send out your vibes. Um, so, yeah, and kind of closing, I mean, uh, as, as far as the, you know, who knows what will happen, we'll, we'll keep in touch because I think, you know, music will always be a thing. It's just shifting. Um, so maybe this will be virtual kind of setups and silent discos at home or whatever, but you're dope as fuck. Your music's tits. I love it. Um, you're a cool dude. I hope to hang out you. at some point. Definitely, dude. I'm not just saying that. Like I met it. Like I, I as soon as I met you and hung out with some of y'all at that thing, I was like, oh, this is tribe. This is, this is just how it is. Um, yeah, beautiful I location. I feel it. So I guess in closing, yeah, I mean, Orcas well, Island, man, this is oh, a beautiful dude. place and yeah, if no one knows, Google this. In the San Juan Islands, like it was, took a ferry boat to get there. It's kind of a ratchet situation. Uh, very beautiful. Like it's it's different than uh, anything I'd ever experienced. Um, I guess in closing, I'll kind of just say it's very much like the uh, Bill Hicks situation when he talks about like you know like enjoy the ride. Like whole, you know it's just a ride. Don't take it too seriously. And what we do need to do right now is kind of vibe where we want. Like which which timeline do we prefer? Because, you know, fear or love, that's the whole point of the Bill Hicks thing. It's like, are you going towards more locks in your doors, more yeah. fucking flu shots, more freaking out, like more disempowerment? Or are you going towards authenticity and integrity and love and compassion and further up and further in? Um, that further up and further in comes from C.S. Lewis's The Last Battle in Narnia as, you know, basically. Um, and this is where I'm going to kind of leave it because, I, yes, there's all this metaphysical speculation. And let's go to the other side and all this stuff. But it's like I think this is a kind of Christian type. Uh, I think that all the Bodhisattva energy is coming this way. I think it's starting to crash into here, hopefully, and it imbues this reality in such a way that it, it kind of gets into a golden age. Um, long story it always short, has the last been, battle. Man. Exactly, it's a matter of perspective. This, We're there. This life is the is the proving ground. This earth is literally the testament. Like our uh, lines in the sand is is drawn naturally and supernaturally here on this earth and you can build your temple or just let it get dirty. Amen. Um, I'll say this and then I'll let you say a final word and Raphael can close it out. Uh, the track I actually picked to close this out, you probably won't hear it right now, but maybe if you hear this interview later, 17 minute track by justice called planosphere, which I think is just this like kind of architectural thing, but I think you'll appreciate it. if you haven't heard it, if you have, you'll get it. Um, but CS Lewis from the last battle says, um, long story short, it's this apocalyptic situation. All this shit's going to shit, and you know, it's an apocalypse in their world, a last battle. And basically, this one character says, "I've come home at last. This is my real country. I belong here. This is the land I've been looking for all my life, though I never knew it till now. 
come further up and come further in. Guys, heaven is a place on earth. If you so choose, you got to just vibrate in that space and we can do that. It's a choice, love or fear. So I hope everybody chooses love and I hope to see you guys in the real life. Yeah, man, let's vibrate like the Mayans to that higher sphere. If you want to get all quetzalcoatl about it. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate the honor. Thank you both. This is Team Rabbit Hole Edition 93 live in action. And uh, to close off, kindly mute yourself. Thank you. Rather than coming up with something super smart to say, I will just read one paragraph from The Secret Teachings of All Ages. Since we all agree on the great contribution that Manly P. Hall has given us, as it is, the 93rd episode refers to the hanged man. Therefore, quote, especially, no, esoterically, the hanged man is the human spirit, which is suspended from heaven by a single thread. Wisdom, not death, is the reward for this voluntary sacrifice during which the human soul, suspended above the world of illusion and meditating upon its unreality, is rewarded by the achievement of self-realization. Thank you both once again, and uh, thank you all for listening. Enjoy yourselves. Thanks, Raphael. Radio Pokey Talk, 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 Radio Pokey Talk,